For our next panel, we are excited to, jo to be joined by Anubha Bosle, who is the founder of Newsworthy and the former executive director of CNN IBN. Ms. Bosle is an award-winning journalist and entrepreneur who has reported on issues related to politics, social justice, conflict, and citizen movements. She's also been an ICFG Knight Fellow, a Fulbright Fellow, and a Jefferson Fellow. Uh, Ms. Bosle will be in conversation with Professor Ron Liebert, who is the Professor of Political Science and the Director of Citizen Lab at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. The Citizen Lab is an interdisciplinary laboratory focusing on research, development, and high-level strategic policy and legal engagement at the intersection of information and communication technologies, human rights, and global security. It was the Citizen Lab, which first revealed the ongoing use of Pegasus against Indian citizens through a report in 2019. Since then, they have continued to work against the rapid proliferation of such spyware. Citizen Lab also conducted a peer review of the report of Amnesty Tech Security Lab concerning the recent revelations related to Pegasus and NSO made by The Wire and other news organizations in July 2021. Uh, thank you and welcome Anubha and welcome Professor Deepert. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Really glad to be here with you. Thank Hello you so there. much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Anushka, and, uh, and a big welcome to uh, all your viewers uh, joining in. Uh, Ron, it's an absolute privilege to be speaking to you. And that very illustrious introduction means that I have so much to pack uh, in this next 60 minutes that we have with you. Um, I think the IFF has also made it clear that we're inviting audience questions. So we'll try and squeeze in a little bit of time for that. Uh, thank you. Good morning and uh, thank good you morning. for joining us. Good evening. <laughs> thank you, Anura. It's great to be here with you. Um, Ron, so why don't we start with the very basics, so to speak. How did Citizen Lab come to actually peer review this particular Amnesty and Forbidden Stories project, Pegasus? Um, my question is more towards what was known to you at the, at, at the point in time when this list came to you, the origins <laughs> of the list, and was that a factor at all? Thank you for the question. Well, uh, the Citizen Lab, which is based at the University of Toronto, has a mission to investigate uh, targeted espionage. And we have for over a decade now been investigating uh, cases in that area and have focused in particular on the commercial spyware market. There are mercenary companies out there that supply government clients with tools uh, to hack devices and, and uh, monitor civil society, uh, there's extensive abuses around this industry that we've documented. Um, Amnesty International has something called the Tech Lab that started recently. Um, they're uh, partners and friends of ours. Uh, they do very similar work. We've collaborated together. In fact, we did a report together on um, a hacking campaign in India, uh, not related to NSO's Pegasus uh, that we could talk about perhaps. Uh, so we, we are uh, in close conversation with our partners there um, uh, quite regularly. And um, uh, Amnesty International informed us that they were uh, working on uh, an extensive report around NSO and Pegasus um, because of sensitivities and various confidentiality requirements. They couldn't tell us much about it. Um, they did request that we do a peer review both of their methodology that they were using, their forensic methodology, um, and, and also a, a more direct peer review of a subset of some of the phones that they determined were hacked with Pegasus. Um, we were not given access to the list of phone numbers that you describe um, and still don't have access to them because of confidentiality reasons. Um, I can say that the peer review, as you can read in our uh, website, uh, was very straightforward. Their methodology is sound. That's not surprising. We use very similar techniques to, our, to what our colleagues at Amnesty International use. Um, and the forensic analysis of the devices that were shared with us also verified um, what Amnesty discovered. And I'd like to add that we were given copies of um, uh, the backups of these devices, uh, essentially mirror images of, of the disks uh, without any context whatsoever. We were just provided with these and said, tell us what you found. And um, uh, within literally, I think it was a minute in each case, our lead researcher 
uh, senior researcher Bill Marzak was able to quickly confirm that they were all hacked with Pegasus. Um, the, the list of numbers um, is, has been uh, described only in general terms by Amnesty International and for, Forbidden Stories uh, because they want to protect the source. Uh, there's some concern that whoever provided them with this list of phone numbers might be at risk. And so they're describing it only in very general terms. Um, uh, I believe that, uh, based on what I've seen, uh, that the list uh, is, is, is a kind of pre-reconnaissance uh, uh, database. So in other words, government clients of NSO will use uh, this service that provided this list uh, to um, uh, identify the phone numbers uh, to see if the phones are active before they then fire off Pegasus spyware. Um, uh, so um, that's essentially my understanding of, of how the list evolved. Are you still there? I believe I may have lost Anuba. An Anushka, can I you think, hear me? Yeah. I think we lost Anoba. She's just joined back. I think she'll be with okay. us in two minutes. Hi, Anoba. Can you hear us? I can. I am extremely sorry for uh, for that. No problem. Loss of electricity and the loss of connection. Um, and I'm sorry uh, to have missed the last part of your uh, answer, Robert. Uh, Ronald, I'm, I'm wondering uh, if, if this is something that you've already answered, then you can skip it off. But I think yeah. my question was, is, is it a factor at all uh, that we should know about the origins of the list for which you've done a peer review and for which it has become clear that some of the phones in India and across the world did have the spyware of Pegasus? Is that a factor? Do the origins <clears throat> the list matter? Uh, they do and they don't. Uh, first of all, we didn't do a peer review of the phone numbers per se. Of we course. did a, a very uh, narrow peer review. I have not had any access to this list. Um, <clears throat> based on my understanding of how the, um, how the communications infrastructure globally works and based on the correlations that have now come forward, including our report just published this morning, uh, where we went to Forbidden Stories, asked them to check a number of phone numbers to see if they were on this list, and they can confirm that five were. Um, this list has strong empirical grounding, I would say. Um, it is good evidence of government clients of NSO doing a kind of pre-reconnaissance uh, of targets. So say I'm a government client and I wanted to hack your phone. I might go to this service provider, let's call it, uh, who can inform me that maybe the make and model of your phone and uh, whether your phone is, is online and whether it's in a particular geographic location where I'm able to hack you. Uh, then I might fire off Pegasus at your phone. Um, so I, I think this list is very credible. I have no concerns that details on the origins of the list have been withheld. That's very prudent. Uh, you're a journalist, you know, sometimes you have to protect your sources. That's what's happening here. Great. So that's good to hear. And that's a great stamp, uh, uh, Ron. Um, I'm wondering, this is not the first time the Citizen Lab has encountered Pegasus, so to speak. Uh, your findings as far as Project Pegasus are concerned, do you believe they're consistent with what the Citizen Lab has found about the NSO and about Pegasus over the last couple of years? And is there, is there some diversion? Are we, are we moving towards a different direction uh, with Pegasus, uh, with Project Pegasus and the findings now? That's a very good question. Thank you for that. I, I would say it does indeed fall squarely in line with what we have observed ourselves and published prior to the Pegasus project. What it does is simply amplify all of the findings in every possible direction. So we knew already uh, based on our own public reporting, in particular a report published in 2018, that NSO's technology is used by uh, a wide range, dozens of government clients. Uh, a lot of those government clients have very poor human rights track records. Uh, their security agencies lack oversight 
Uh, so not surprisingly, this technology is going to be abused widely. Uh, we had a, a case uh, that you'll be familiar with in 2019 uh, involving WhatsApp and an NSO exploit at that time, very similar to the Pegasus projects. We had a, a very short window of targeting that uh, data that was shared with us by WhatsApp. And uh, we were able to identify more than 100 civil society victims in many countries around the world, including, uh, I think, uh, uh, at least 30 in India at that time. Um, so the Pegasus project has simply added more evidence to the already existing mountain of evidence of widespread abuse of this type of commercial surveillance technology. We're really talking about something that I've been describing now as despotism as a service, right? You, you are, you know, autocrats, dictators, illiberal regimes, corrupt authorities. Uh, in the past, it would have been very difficult to do this type of surveillance. But thanks to companies like NSO Group, and thanks also to the fact that we all carry around these devices in our pockets at all times. Um, dictators, autocrats, despots can reach across borders silently into the pockets of their targets and observe everything that they're doing. This is powerful technology that I believe it's an epidemic uh, and it's uh, probably one of the most serious threats to liberal democracy and human rights today. That's a, that's a really strong phrase. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about NSO, you know, all these weeks and months since that story broke, the NSO has sort of continued to insist that they don't really know if and how their clients, which means governments actually use this spyware. There are two parts to my question. You know, oh, for a military great supplier of surveillance to, as you said, countries with very poor human rights record, is that a believable argument, number one? And number two, if you have an Israeli defense ministry as sort of the vetting agency is that really a safeguard for a global order? I mean, forget about enough of a safeguard. Is that a safeguard for a global order? Well, the, the short answer to one is no, it's not credible. And the short answer to two, two is it's no protection whatsoever. So I, I can elaborate. Um, with respect to, to the first question about NSO's claims, first of all, N NSO is engaged in a kind of PR theater. Um, over the years that we've been doing reports, We've had exchanges with the company. We've uh, heard and read their responses. They have one out this morning. Uh, basically, what they do is cast dispersions, uh, ad hominem attacks on groups like Citizen Lab or Amnesty International, questioning our motives, saying that we're doing this for ulterior reasons or, or whatever. They never actually point to a specific error in our research. And I should add that our research is, is open and public. We are a university-based research group. So, you know, we pride ourselves on having everything that we do uh, undertaken through peer review. So, you know, those reports have been up there for years. I, I'm not aware of a single error in those reports that anyone has pointed out. Um, if we at Citizen Lab, can observe NSO's infrastructure and the abuses that we've documented extensively now, surely the company can do it themselves. So I do not believe virtually anything that the company says at this point or its various shareholders, investors, PR groups that, that the company has hired. This is all, um, uh, you know, a, a, as I said, theater. Uh, an attempt to shroud and confuse people about what they're doing yeah, in order to continue making a profit. Um, and the, the, the re most recent report we just published this morning uh, is further evidence of, of gross negligence on the part of the company. Uh, there is no way that uh, this company can claim it has any meaningful human rights due diligence mechanisms in place when it sells to serial human rights offenders like Bahrain or Saudi Arabia um, or what's going on in India or Mexico, you know, go on and on and on these cases. Um, you know, so I, I just don't think it's credible at all. Uh, interestingly, the second question you ask, uh, NSO Group does 
go through an export control, uh, uh, export license review process. And that process is undertaken by the Israeli Ministry of Defense. This points to a failure in uh, the regulations around this industry. Uh, for whatever reason, Israel is very um, uh, permissive when it comes to these export uh, licenses. I, I don't know, I'm not privy to what type of decision making goes on, but all I can say is that um, NSO continues to sell to some of these notorious uh, illiberal regimes worldwide. And, and so they don't seem to uh, care about the human rights component of the export licensing process, which su suggests there's some kind of geopolitical play going on here, which is not really surprising. Um, Israel, of course, has an extensive geopolitical strategy of its own in which NSO's, NSO groups exports figure prominently in my mind. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to touch sort of uh, uh, on the global surveillance market, so to speak, how big this business is, what would be the cutting edge technology, so to speak, available. Uh, but considering, you know, you touched upon NSO and their public appearances, I saw a, a brief clip uh, on, on 60 Minutes on CBS, in, on which I think you were uh, there as well. And I think you were, you were talking about an important point about that we are allowing these clients uh, or quote unquote governments to actually frame what is a crime, what it is, yes. what is a terrorism, uh, what is terrorism and who they can go about surveilling and, and the fallout of that, uh, speak a little bit to that, that you know, you've yeah. almost got one particular ministry sitting as a veto power, so to speak, and allowing other governments to frame what is terrorism, what is a crime, et cetera. Yeah. This is, you, you absolutely hit, hit at one of the key weaknesses around, uh, you know, the, the pretense of safeguards that NSO and companies like them say they have in place, which is they always claim consistently, we only sell our technology to government clients who use it to investigate serious matters of national security and crime. Well, that sounds very straightforward and plausible and legitimate. The big problem that you rightly uh, zeroed in on is that uh, what constitutes national security worthy of investigation, what constitutes a criminal offense is in the eye of the beholder. So time and again, we've seen journalists, lawyers, even academics, research scientists uh, and others uh, framed as criminals, described as terrorists. Uh, Jamal Khashoggi, the murdered Washington Post journalist, uh, executed for speaking his mind and, and writing columns in the Washington Post. From the perspective of Mohammed bin Salman, I suppose mm -hmm. Khashoggi is a terrorist or a criminal. Mm -hmm. um, so what the company is doing is simply handing this ex extraordinarily invasive technology over to government ministries and agencies that are going to predictably abuse them. And that's, that's the problem that we have right now and why I think it's, it's what I would call an epidemic. Um, Ron, uh, Shashi Tarur, uh, um, who's an Indian parliamentarian and in the opposition was in session one of this. Uh, and he said he's made this uh, statement before as well that, you know, we really have no clarity from the government whether uh, Pegasus is, was used, bought, deployed. Um, and, you know, that, yes, today there is a legitimate concern that the government of this country may have used spyware against its own citizens. I am wondering, and you're right, uh, you know, when you said that this is all about the beholder, I'm wondering why is it to, so tough for us to add both elements of this equation, considering there is a company that says that they sell only two vetted clients, and considering we found, uh, you know, the Pegasus spyware on Indians, and considering their role is in a very domestic sphere, you know, they're mm -hmm. people of interest really in a domestic sphere. So you've really got all angles together, what yeah. would it take to sort of complete this equation? Well, the equation's already been completed as far as I'm concerned. I mean, we have now ample evidence of uh, targeted espionage against civil society in India, let's call it broadly. Uh, our own reports show that. 
the WhatsApp case that I uh, described um, involved us notifying uh, several dozen uh, members of Indian civil society, not all of whom came out publicly. Uh, this was in 2019. Uh, I think around 18 or 20 of them eventually did. Um, so we know about them. <laughs> Uh, we also know uh, about the Pegasus Project cases. I think Amnesty International, uh, outside, separate from the list, the list is evidence of some kind of reconnaissance. It doesn't necessarily mean those people were hacked. Um, but Amnesty did go out, and I think if memory serves me correct, uh, positively verified 11 of the devices or so were hacked. Um, so that's a very significant number. Uh, look, it's not surprising, really. Um, most countries around the world have very few safeguards around their intelligence agencies, around their security agencies, my country included. Um, you know, we, we know very little about how those agencies operate because they operate in secrecy, behind closed doors. Um, of course, governments are not going to be frank and forthcoming about that sort of stuff because they can conveniently say, um, either deny, <laughs> that it's happening or say this is a national security matter. Um, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to look at the Indian case and realize that you have um, pretty widespread abuse of police powers and intelligence powers. Uh, India also has a very uh, well-resourced foreign espionage uh, mm -hmm. capability and it routinely engages in espionage abroad. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, you know, that's just the reality. Politicians will try to dance around it and make it sound like it's not happening. But as far as I'm concerned, uh, the, the circle has been uh, closed here. We know exactly what's going on. Okay. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's true for the Indian government and it's really true for many governments uh, who've, caught, uh, who've been caught sort of in Project Pegasus in a sense. I think the two statements that we've heard from most governments, national security and the fact that we have safeguards in place or an oversight mechanism in place. Um, Ron, if I, if I can sort of go to the next part of this conversation, this is targeted surveillance, right? Yeah. Uh, how do we how do we sort of cross the road and take it to Mars surveillance? Or is that already happening? Is technology already there for that purpose? And I'm wondering, this is expensive. So if there was to be Mars surveillance, it needs to be cheaper, easier, more comp less complicated, so to speak, right? Yeah. Well, that's a very good question too. The way I look at it is within a very short period of time, uh, really within 10 to 15 years, we've all rushed headlong into an embrace of these digital technologies. Um, I was in India just prior to the pandemic, and I don't need to tell you, your audience uh, how extensive mobile technologies are in that country. It's the same all over the world. Everybody has at least one, maybe two devices. The problem is that um, the entire ecosystem upon which all of this rests was not built with security in mind. Uh, it's invasive by design because of surveillance capitalism, the business model, which is essentially about trying to put more and more sensors in your devices to gather as much information about you for, uh, for basically economic reasons. Um, but that creates huge insecurities um, that governments now exploit thanks to the assistance of the surveillance industry. Um, so one way to think about the surveillance industry, you have uh, targeted espionage, which we've been talking about, which is essentially hacking devices. Uh, but then you have many other layers of service providers that do different types of surveillance provision. Uh, mass surveillance is, um, uh, of course, a bedrock of this. There are many vendors that supply uh, telecommunications companies and by extension intelligence agencies or police forces with equipment uh, that monitors uh, traffic at scale. Um, it's interesting, I think, and important to note the relationship between this type of surveillance and the business model of surveillance mm -hmm. capitalism because they cross over seamlessly. I'll give you an example. Um, there is a huge industry around location tracking data almost all of your applications ask for permission to observe your location. Then there are companies um, that 
essentially harvest that data and then monetize it. Some of that uh, monetization is directed towards other businesses, maybe in advertising, but some of it is now directed towards law enforcement, towards intelligence agencies. Um, that's very rich, uh, highly invasive data. Uh, you know, your phone can tell a lot about your movements and we're essentially emitting this digital exhaust at all times. So an enormous industry has sprouted up that essentially vacuums all of this up, uh, analyzes it, and then presents it as a product or a service to a client, whether that's another business or a government security agency. Um, so th frankly, the, the system is broken and mm -hmm. we are now seeing uh, the harms that result from this um, uh, incredibly insecure, poorly regulated, invasive by design infrastructure that we live upon. I love this phrase, digital exhaust, that we are all emitting at all points in time. Uh, Ron, so then to sort of take your argument further, uh, if there is this product in the market and the business model of the surveillance industry works this way, there is nothing to stop that product from today being used for one purpose and tomorrow being used for tracking a peaceful protest, right? But there really is little, I would say. I mean, mm -hmm. part of the aim of what groups like Amnesty International Tech Lab do, Access Now, EFF, your, the, own, the organization here as well. Um, you know, all of us are trying to raise awareness about mm -hmm. these problems, identify issues that raise human rights concerns, whether it's artificial intelligence, facial recognition, whatever. Um, mm -hmm. We're doing our best. So I wouldn't say there's nothing, you know, to the extent that we can raise awareness, bring public pressure, perhaps some remedies could be uh, uh, introduced. Uh, what we desperately need is a wholesale set of uh, regulations around the tech space um, that restrain what governments and companies can do with the data that they collect. Um, this will be uncomfortable and painful because we've gotten used to the convenience of an always on digitally connected world. It's very fun, uh, it's very useful, but it has a dark side and the dark side is causing serious harm. We need to address it. I think uh, it would be a sort of remiss of me if I didn't add the context of uh, COVID-19 and the pandemic, uh, because in many ways, the pandemic has sort of opened the inroads, right? We have almost sort of opened our arms and said, come take everything that you need to know, you know about us, but just keep us safe. So there's sort of this wider acceptance, if I can call it, or a fair company, so to speak, that yes, you know, we have to give this, these are the times we live in. How do we tackle that? Well, first of all, you're absolutely right. COVID is a very um, uh, serious, um, beyond the obvious parts of the, the disease itself. There is this issue around the kind of new normal that is mm -hmm. being rolled out around surveillance. Some of it is perhaps justified, right? We're in a serious emergency. Many people have lost their lives. Um, India in particular has had terrible trauma and, and grief around uh, uh, what has happened. I'm very sorry for that. So in such a context, of course, you wanna use technology to be able to monitor and, and prevent and mitigate uh, the disease from spreading. Um, the problem is uh, exactly what I talked about before. We're relying on an infrastructure that is invasive by design, poorly regulated, insecure, and prone to abuse. And then we're very quickly building on top of it a biomedical surveillance architecture. So it's kind of like the, the analogy I'm using is imagine you have a house and the house, the foundation for the house is rotting. Um, and yet you're going to build a second floor addition to the house, you know, eventually the house will collapse or perhaps make you sick, right? And that's, that's what we're doing here. We're entering into a new phase where we're relying on these very invasive technologies and they have all sorts of pathologies uh, uh, connected to them. Um, so I, I see this as, you know, it's often the case in history, events like this pandemic or even an event like the Olympics, um, what happens is, these are moments in time where governments introduce all sorts of uh, special measures 
right? And extraordinary powers and new types of technologies are rolled out. But after the event passes, whether it's the pandemic subsiding or the Olympics finishing, that infrastructure remains in place. We've seen this all over the world and it's happening right now with COVID. So we have to have our, our eyes open for those type of risks. You know, this is a slightly sort of skeptic view of it, but, you know, many citizens will actually sort of come forward and uh, get into this debate with us and say that, hey, these are the times we live in. There are good uses to surveillance as well. And at this point in time, it's sort of so much technology. And as you've said, this digital exhaust being fumed uh, into the privacy are you comfortable with? So if you've got sort of nothing to hide, then you should be okay about it. Uh, how do we challenge, uh, challenge this particular notion and why is it problematic, if at all? It is problematic, I, although I understand the sentiment. I, I often feel the same way. It's like, oh, I, you know, I need to get from one part of town to the other. I better pull out Google Maps or something, right? I'm not going to worry about it. Or, I, I, geez, I, I hate vacuuming my house. Maybe I'll get a Roomba and it will monitor my entire layout of my house and send that off to a company. Um, the, the issue about uh, if you've got uh, nothing to hide, you've got nothing to fear, um, the problem with that argument is very basic. People who abuse power don't care whether you have nothing to hide. They want to take advantage of innocent people. That's why they're bad people. And there are a lot of bad people on the planet. Um, I have seen firsthand evidence in our research of friends, innocent family members, children of targets having their phones hacked by governments because they want to get at their mother or their sister or whatever, um, gather incriminating photos that can be used for blackmail. Um, so this is why we need safeguards. We need restraints. We need regulatory restraints around what governments and companies can do so that they Bad people don't exploit the, uh, the fissures and the opportunities that are provided to them to do bad things. That, it's as basic as that. Every government who would have responded to Project Pegasus has possibly used these two words, right? That we've got safeguards in place, we've got oversight in place, uh, you know, our surveillance, so to speak, matches the test of legality or national security, et cetera. Uh, in the Indian context, considering you've had three reports on Bhima Koregao as well, and you've put forward suggestions on oversight, what do you think is missing? Well, I think the, the key ingredient that is missing here is independent oversight, right? So, you know, Ronald Reagan had this phrase that he said to Mikhail Gorbachev, trust but verify, right? And that, that's the same uh, logic we need to apply to government security agencies, right? We just can't take them at their word. Um, so we need to look at the safeguards. Are, are there institutions in place that can responsibly and credibly verify that there are no abuses of power taking place. That is a it's, a, it's a, it's a question of political architecture, really. Like, do you have this set up in your country? I think it's fair to say that it's not there in India because we know that there are extensive abuses. The case you mentioned is particularly noteworthy because what happened here is people were arrested, charged with crimes, and then it later emerged through forensic analysis that uh, incriminating documents were placed on their devices directly. Um, so this is what we're talking about here. Bad people can do bad things if there aren't safeguards in place to watch them. So we need to watch the watchers, right? That's part of what Citizen Lab does. That's part of what Amnesty International does and other groups do. Um, but we are outside of formal mechanisms. We are watchdogs, but we don't have any power or authority. You need there to be some institution that has power, that has authority, that can come forward in the public interest and say, this government security agency is, is stepping outside of its bounds and it needs to be punished in some way. Uh, right now, that's not happening. And I think um, it, uh, it needs to be pointed out here that the IFF itself has done some stellar work on this and sort of pointed out how many of these safeguards or oversight are sort of mere placeholders, so to speak. Uh, uh, Ron, Absolutely. I'm sure... I, I love IFF. I, I, shout out to <laughs> IFF. Well shout done. Out, eh? 
um, you know, I uh, was uh, during the course of the course of my research and and sort of journalistic work. I understood how Citizen Lab got involved with Bhima Koregaon, but I think maybe for the average citizen, uh, how how did you uh, and the institution go about working for three years on sort of a case uh, that you know has got public imagination now? But in 2018, when the violence broke out, I remember there were just snippets of information, and no one ever realized uh, that you would link Bhima Koregaon and human rights activists. To Project Pegasus one day, you know. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so the for Citizen Lab, we we uh, our our scope is global. I mean, we we are not just focused on India. We're focused on countries all over the world. As you see, we have a report out this morning on Bahrain. Uh, we are also a, a, quite a small team, actually. We there there are only a few people that work in this area in the Citizen Lab. Um, so we are definitely overstretched. Um, however, um, success builds upon success. It leads to more success. So uh, as we publish, other people come forward, usually through the community of, of human rights networks uh, with maybe tips uh, or um, suggestions on where we should focus our, our precious resources in terms of research time. And so in the case of India, I, I can say that, look, there, there are so many examples of, of um, uh, extensive surveillance and surveillance abuse that uh, you just try to pick the cases that um, seem urgent to you and that have mm -hmm. some kind of credible evidence behind it. Um, so that's what we've been doing. And, and thankfully, we've been um, you know, uh, able to shed light on some of these cases, hopefully in an instructive way to inspire people to do something about it, uh, to change the equation. But it's not just what's going on in India. Um, it's, you know, Mexico is a very, very similar in some respects to the Indian situation, insofar as we've seen widespread serial abuse of not just Pegasus, but other types of surveillance technologies, a real problem around a lack of accountability and the use of this technology to target political opposition, uh, mm -hmm. lawyers, human rights activists. Um, so yeah, we have a couple of places around the world that are in really dire straits right now because of this powerful technology and the lack of safeguards. I'm just gonna put uh, my questions on hold for just a minute or two, because I can see some questions coming in from the audience. There's a question that's come on their YouTube channel, uh, uh, possibly something that we have touched upon a little bit, who says, uh, who asks, how far is sort of data harvesting really breaching anyone's privacy? Uh, when, as you, as you said, we ourselves are allowing them to track everything, our location and our digital exhaust is mm -hmm. robust and thick. Well, you know, the, the, that's an interesting way of phrasing it because it is true. Uh, a lot of the uh, applications that we download on our phones request permission. Um, and they, they, we give them, we consent to using them. No one's putting a gun to our head and saying, hey, you must use Google or Facebook. People love it, right? And they use it. Uh, the problem is on a number of levels, the free will behind that choice is a bit dubious. Uh, mm -hmm. What do I mean by that? First of all, look at the terms of consent of any application on your device right now. You will encounter uh, 50 pages of legalese that very few people read let alone can understand. You have to be a lawyer to, and, and this is, uh, you know, a, a, a an agreement that's designed to protect the company from liability, not protect you, and give them permission to essentially appropriate your personal data as their private property. Right? Mm -hmm. The companies also use various slates of hand to trick you in 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 various ways. Um, they make the technology very addictive. Uh, we are beginning to understand the addictive qualities and some of the harms around social media. Um, you know, this is why people scroll endlessly, right? It's, it's very Pavlovian. It's very uh, B.F. Skinner 101. Um, so we, we're not entering into an agreement in a, uh, with 100% knowledge 
of the terms of the agreement and we're being duped in various ways. So um, that's how I would answer that, that question. So this, is, this isn't an informed decision sort of yes. in our right minds completely. I think the second question also sort of leads to that because I think this is an important sort of touch point for an ordinary citizen. Uh, the person asks, what can ordinary citizens then do to avoid this surveillance, so to speak? And I love this question. Does getting a base model help for one? Should we chuck away our smartphones and go back to those simple simple ones? What remedial measures, uh, he or she asks, would you suggest? Well, uh, that, that's a, a, an important but also very complicated question to answer because our report just published this morning shows that the latest uh, evolution of NSO's Pegasus spyware uh, involves uh, what's what we call zero click. Um, mm -hmm. So they can simply target a phone and take it over. And there's uh, very little observable evidence happening on the part of the victim. So you, you don't even know that your phone has been commandeered. And uh, if you have the latest version of Apple, iOS at the time, even that won't defend you, um, as we've shown, because these were, at the time of the hacking, uh, software vulnerabilities that even Apple itself was unaware of. Um, the reality is we have these companies that put a lot of resources into quickly pushing out products and applications. They do spend time on security. Uh, Apple has a very well-resourced, talented security team. But the problem is, uh, the adversaries, which in this case would be a company like NSO, and there are many companies like it, spend uh, a lot of resources of their own scouring those applications, the software for bugs that they can exploit. And there are so many of them. That's the reality of this invasive by design ecosystem that we live in. Um, so how do we fix that? Oh my goodness, it's, it's very difficult. Uh, how do you defend against it? Sadly, I don't think there is currently a defense. Um, you know, I, it, it, it really disturbs me to say this because we have activists, you know, emailing us and saying, what can I do to prevent being targeted? Well, there, I'm sorry to say there is nothing right now, um, which means we have to think about wholesale uh, changes to the entire infrastructure, the regulatory and technological infrastructure. That's going to take a long time. It's not impossible. Um, but it is a, a very steep mountain that we have to climb to change this. There's another question that's come on NSO in specific that has the group provided the thorough vetting process. And I think there were some public statements to that regard, considering they sold their product to Mexico and to many other countries. Did NSO do a vetting? No, obviously not. They have they provided proof of a thorough vetting process? No. No, they don't, they don't do anything like that. They, they say they do, but obviously they don't. Um, you know, it's clear to me that what they are doing is PR theater. They hire these public relations firms and lawyers essentially to, to cover themselves and to make themselves appear, I don't know to who, because it's clear to, to me, we've been doing this research for long enough that uh, they're statements are baseless. Uh, they obviously do not do due diligence. I mean, how can you sell repeatedly to Saudi Arabia? What do you think Bahrain is going to do with your spyware? I mean, this is, as I say, gross negligence in the name of profit. But as you rightly said, you know, previously in our conversation, there are many, many levers to this, right? Considering this yeah. is military grade, considering there's an Israeli defense ministry, considering it has links with other countries. Uh, you know, I want to circle back uh, considering you worked on NSO and Pegasus and other spyware for years now, um, what, how intimate has the invasion become? I mean, how close are they to knowing everything about us? Where did it start and how quickly has it traveled? Well, um, you know, again, this, this can't be answered without thinking about the business model and surveillance mm -hmm. capitalism that we've kind of sleepwalked into it's happened so quickly within my lifetime i can remember you know they're not being the internet uh and and not certainly not having mobile phones just within the last i don't know 15 years now we've we just dove headlong into this embrace of a technology that 
is effectively turning our lives inside out. So every aspect of our personal lives is now being observed. And when you have an ecosystem that's poorly regulated and invasive by design like that, inevitably bad governments are going to exploit that. Um, it's instructive to me looking historically how important the Arab Spring was in this regard. So we all remember the Arab Spring uh, uh, where uh, people were mobilized using digital technology and social media. People were calling it a Twitter revolution, a Facebook revolution and so forth. Well, the dictators and autocrats around the world took a different lesson. They observed what was going on and, say, and said to themselves, how do we prevent this from ever happening again? Mm -hmm. And they went out and they contracted with uh, countless numbers of surveillance companies that provided them with tools, techniques, services, and products that effectively have enabled them to track, hack, and neutralize political opposition, both domestically and abroad. We are seeing an epidemic of transnational digital repression. And this is not something that was designed by Facebook or Zuckerberg or, people, or even ourselves. We didn't, you know, it's often the case in history, un unanticipated consequences are like a master narrative. You know, we do something and we don't see how it's going to rebound and impact us unexpectedly. And that's what happened. That's what's happened with social media. We've developed this system that has all sorts of pathologies that is dysfunctional in many ways and causing widespread harm. How to fix it? Well, I mean, that's, there are so many different components to the solution set here. But the bottom one I would just recommend to everybody is to think about restraint. Think about restraint mechanisms. What does restraint look like in the context of India around security agencies? What would it look like to be able to control abuse by local police? How would we do that? Right? That's what we need to work on at a very ground level in every jurisdiction. We need to do that here in Toronto. We have police uh, that uh, you know, abuse their power here in Toronto. They use facial recognition, artificial intelligence, very poor oversight. We need to work on that here in Canada, mm -hmm. just like you do in Delhi. Um, there's a question that's come from one of the viewers who's watching in, uh, and he speaks about Shashi Tharoor's opinion, uh, the Indian parliamentarian who was there in the first part uh, of the program, that the best and perhaps the only viable option for a so-called victim of Pegasus today in India is to approach the judiciary. Perhaps. I don't know. I'm not an expert in Indian judicial politics to know whether that will lead to something or not. Um, it, it, the problem is, uh, you, as an individual, there's very little you can do to defend yourself against this type of extra legal surveillance. Um, if it's not Pegasus, it will be something else. Um, it could be a store front hack for hire operation, like the one we discovered in Delhi called Beltrox that was behind a massive global espionage campaign. It could be a mass surveillance technology. The cell phone infrastructure is notoriously insecure. Uh, there are vendors that can uh, provide to virtually any client details on a person's location and even intercept their SMS messages uh, for several hundred dollars on the black market. Um, we've, we live in a fundamentally broken ecosystem right now, and it's being exploited widely by government uh, agents. Um, you know, I we're 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 heading towards the end of this conversation, and I don't want to leave on a pessimistic note, so to speak. Uh, but I know that uh, uh, Dr. Tarur, when he was possibly in the first part of this uh, uh, this particular program, had really spoken about you know the limited nature of what Parliament can do. They can't subpoena. They can't ask for evidence. Uh, you know there are only a certain ways to go perhaps a commission of inquiry, et cetera. So sort of the parliament being, and really here in India, even our standing committees, et cetera, or our special committees have found it tough to get the government to respond in a coherent manner on Pegasus. Right. So in a sense, you know, people are looking towards judicial scrutiny. I'm wondering yeah. at an institutional level, uh, what are the safeguards we must have? And do you believe India has those safeguards. Let's say if they were to work in a far more robust manner, 
uh, would they, would they help uh, in some way? Definitely, there the solution has to involve uh, proper independent agencies that have meaningful oversight. Uh, so these, you know, you you find vestiges of this in other country contexts, whether it's you know United States, they have special Senate committees where senators are able to, you know, they're privy to classified intelligence and their job is to monitor uh, the security agencies. Um, there's a court that the NSA, the National Security Agency has to go to um, that um, uh, provides a degree of oversight. Um, but these are all flawed in various ways for various reasons, right? Um, but we can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Uh, so we need to start somewhere. And what I would advocate um, at a policy level is for Indians who care about this topic to elect officials who will vow to rein in this type of abuse and work towards building appropriate independent safeguards. Uh, typically, that should be made up of a broad cross-section of, of uh, credible people whose authority is respected, journalists, judiciary, uh, former politicians, et cetera. And they need to have access to uh, what the, the agencies are doing behind closed doors. And they're, they're a watchdog with formal powers. That, that's what we all have to work towards. It's going to be very tough because in some countries right now, um, think about Saudi Arabia, for example, it's a non-starter. It's not going to happen. So we also have to look at the industry and although we may not be able to change the outlook in Israel, um, we can do a lot in other regions around the world. And again, this is not an Israel only problem. It's a okay. problem of this industry. So the United States, Canada, United Kingdom, France, Euro European Union, they bear a lot of responsibility as well. Um, all, all of these countries are in this business. We may not hear about their vendors, but you can bet that the Canadian government, the US government are using spyware technology to do various things right now. Um, they need to, they have a responsibility, I would say, to step up, speak out against these abuses and start taking steps uh, to build global regulations around this industry. It can be done. Um, I believe that uh, the executives of NSO Group should be considered for something like a Magnitsky sanctions list. Uh, why are we allowing these people to profit from the harms that they are facilitating? Uh, they should be punished for that. And there are mechanisms, legal regulatory mechanisms, like the Magnitsky Act, that could be employed in this case. Uh, yeah, Ron, is there a figure? Is there a figure to the global surveillance market? Well, the problem is there are figures out there, many billions of dollars. The companies are valued publicly, billions of dollars. Uh, the problem is a lot of the contracting takes place in secret. The companies themselves employ various shell games where they, they have front companies and, and you know, shell companies that they employ to, to essentially mask uh, their profits and revenue streams uh, from investigations. So it's, it's large <laughs> and growing. It's large and growing. Um, I had a couple of rapid fire kind of questions. We're almost about just about two to three minutes left. Uh, I'll okay. see if there are any other questions that have come in, none so far. Uh, but just uh, someone from, from sort of my team asked, does the country of origin of your phone matter? Are Chinese phones more susceptible? Uh it, it, yes and no. Um, so okay. one should always be as much as possible acutely aware of the circumstances under which the software was designed and the origins of the device. Um, you know, a context like China, China has a very transparent cybersecurity law that requires all companies operating in China to undertake surveillance of their users. Uh, we have done at the Citizen Lab extensive investigations into WeChat, where we observed that the company does surveillance of its international users and uses that surveillance at the moment to refine its censorship domestically. Um, so, you know, you can't trust any technology, right? That, this gets back to Ronald Reagan, trust but verify. Uh, you have to lift the lid on all of this, which is by the way, another part of what I believe to be the solution around this is to enable people to open up their devices. 
you know, most of the technology that we rely on is like a black box. We don't know what's going on inside because of proprietary protections. Um, if I try to open up this device, the warranty is voided, right? Mm -hmm. um, I learned a lot when I was in India, actually, about the right to repair. Uh, people should be allowed by law to open up their devices and repair and inspect them. Mm -hmm. Encouraging that type of curiosity would be a good first step uh, to um, giving equipping people with defenses against this type of surveillance. Uh, the next question is that if uh, every time I get a notification that asks me to allow that particular application to give access to my location, my images, my photographs, videos, uh, what should I do? Should I say yes or no, or should I do a sort of SWOT analysis? Uh, well, that you know, that's up to everybody. Everybody has to make their own decisions about what's convenient or not and where insecurities may lie. Um, I think it's very important. Uh, to understand what you're giving away as much as possible and um, do scrutinize those terms of service. Um, Apple actually makes it quite convenient for you to turn off location tracking for all of the applications you download. I would encourage people to do things like that. I mean, basically, this is about data minimization, another form of personal restraint, right? Mm -hmm. Like we, we need to be a bit more judicious about what we give away you know, our, our personal data has value and it gives us autonomy. Um, we shouldn't just, you know, routinely shed all of this data to companies that are going to use it to make money. Um, it's our data. We need to take ownership over it. Um, and that, that, that's something that I, I would encourage everybody to think personally about how you can do this better. It's kind of like the attitude that we encourage people around environmental sustainability. I mean, in my lifetime, I can remember people just throwing trash in the street and, you know, throwing away uh, garbage and not recycling. Now, most of us think very carefully about our personal consumption habits. We need to do the same vis-a-vis -vis the data ecosystem that we live in. That's a wonderful way to think about it. So think about the data you're putting out in a sustainable fashion, how much you want yeah. to give out, uh, etc. You know, in India, I've heard this argument a lot. And I find so much evidence to the contrary. I found this argument a lot that this privacy data protection, sort of your rights around this is such a elitist concept. It, it sits right. with people who are sitting in metros uh, and yeah. have access to power. Really, for the average Indian, it's not, it's not a bread yeah. and butter issue. And yet, I find so much evidence of it that people who have Aadhaar cards in India or PAN cards in India, uh, you know, are often so cagey about giving that. I'm wondering why we can't join the two to create more awareness uh, uh, about all this document, about all these numbers, about all this data and, uh, that sort of belongs to us or sits so closely with our identity. Well, I, I think that's where we uh, are grateful to the work of organizations like IFF uh, for raising these issues and educating people. And uh, you know, one can only hope that work of organizations like IFF will, will help bring about the change that you describe. Fair enough, uh, Ronald. This has been a fantastic conversation and I could really go on uh, for a really long time, but uh, thank you so much uh, for answering really every question. But if you think uh, I've left out some sort of big aspect, uh, uh, you know, in this entire debate, in this entire conversation, please, the floor is yours. Uh, well, you know, we've been saying a lot of negative things about surveillance in the context of India. I also want to say how much I love India and I love Indian people and I can't wait to get back and visit all my friends in the country. Hmm. Uh, there's one more question. You're more, okay. more, uh, more than welcome. Just one last question. How do you recommend digital rights organizations in some of our countries begin to develop in-house capacity for this kind of work so that they, they don't have to rely on a few of the organizations in other countries? Uh, yeah, this, that's a, this um, is in relation to independent forensic analysis. Yeah, yeah, this, this is a question that touches at my heart because I'm an academic and one of my goals is to essentially proselytize the mission of the citizen lab. As I said, we're a small organization. Uh, there are very few organizations that do the type of work that we do in this space. Amnesty International Tech Lab is another one. 
Um, we need to see more amnesty tech labs, more citizen labs. How do we make that happen? Um, this is field building, right? We need there to be citizen labs in universities in uh, India and professors who take on uh, the same type of research, educate their students who graduate and then do that sort of thing professionally. We need to build that organically from the ground up. There's no reason it can't be done. Uh, what Citizen Lab, you know, very bright researchers, incredibly talented people, but it's not rocket science, right? Mm -hmm. We're not building a spaceship. We're doing these forensic investigations that are all open source. You can mm -hmm. read our reports and find out how we did it ourselves and duplicate those methods if you want. I encourage uh, that type of ingenuity all over the world. I hope there are a thousand uh, amnesty tech labs and citizen labs in five years from now. Mm -hmm. I'm into that. Uh, 